On behalf of NIOSH supported education and research centers throughout the country, we are pleased to present the 2019 ergonomics webinar series, offering free monthly webinars on various topics on human factors and ergonomics. This collaborative effort on behalf of each ERC's continuing education program aspires to provide access to current research supported through NIOSH ERC programs. Thank you for joining us today. Today's webinar, Vehicle Seat Design, Whole Body Vibration, and Low Back Pain, is brought to you by UC Berkeley and Dr. Pete Johnson. A few housekeeping items first. You will be muted during this presentation. If you would like to ask a question, please enter it into the online chat or Q&A. We will save time at the end of the presentation to address all questions. This webinar will be recorded and archived for viewing on CUEH Northern California's website, Facebook, and YouTube channel. At this time, I am pleased to present our presenter, Dr. Pete Johnson. Peter Johnson, PhD, is a professor in the Occupational and Environmental Exposure Sciences program specializing in ergonomics. He earned his doctorate in bioengineering from the University of California, Berkeley, and has worked as a researcher at the National Institutes of Occupational Health in the United States, Sweden, and Denmark. Dr. Johnson and his lab are nationally and internationally recognized for their work evaluating seating alternatives to reduce vehicle operator exposures to whole body vibration. Thanks for joining us, Pete. All right, thank you for the nice introduction, uh, Jessica. And uh, just, it was a short 30 years ago, I was a, a NIOSH ERC trainee uh, getting my degree at uh, Berkeley, so it's nice to be back. So as Jessica mentioned, I'm gonna present on vehicle seat design, whole body vibration, and low back pain, and hope to go around 45 minutes. And then we'll have around uh, five to 10 minutes for questions afterwards. All right, so one of the things I'm interested in with uh, whole body vibration is it appears that uh, the amount of vibration people receive is related to a low back pain. So we've done a fair amount of work looking at seat types and how it may contribute to low back pain. So that's gonna be the first part of my presentation. Uh, the interesting thing with whole body vibration, as you can see in this slide here, is it affects a large number of uh, workers. And this is data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics on occupations with 20,000 more injuries and illnesses in a year. And you can see labor and freight, uh, heavy tractor trailer and light delivery uh, drivers are all high on this list. So there's large numbers. And if you look at the uh, industry average incident rate as shown by the dark red vertical line, uh, they also have a high incident rate of injury. So this is uh, uh, an important area for research based on the number of workers affected and the high incident rates. Just a little bit of background about whole body vibration and low back pain. Uh, low back injuries are the signal, uh, are the most significant non-lethal medical condition affecting the U.S. workforce and worldwide. Uh, epidemiological studies have consistently linked whole body vibration and low back pain and injury, very strong association. And what we do know is it seems there's a latency where it takes around at least five years or so uh, between the onset of the exposure and the injury. We have a, a great group in Washington State called the SHARP program, uh, which was headed by Barbara Silverstein, who is now enjoying retirement. And they did a lot of great work in Washington State in the trucking sector, and I'm uh, presenting some of their data here. And they looked at injuries in the trucking sector in Washington State, and you can see uh, the injury rate uh, for all industries is around 2.5% uh, uh, for all industries across Washington State. And you can see that the injury rate in the trucking sector, depending on uh, the sector within uh, the trucking uh, segment is anywhere from three to four times higher. So a very high risk group of workers in the trucking sector. If you look at the claims costs, uh, with, with claims requiring days away from work, musculoskeletal disorders are the single largest component of workers' compensation claims in Washington State. And I believe this is really mirrored nationally as well. 
And if you look at the average cost of a claim uh, in the trucking sector where days away from work are involved, the average claim is $30,000. And I know there are uh, trucking companies that self-insure and uh, when they do get an injury, basically they set $30,000 aside uh, to settle the cost of those claims. That's kind of the average cost that private industry has found uh, to settle their claims when they self-insure. And the cost of these claims in Washington state are substantial, $250 million annually for workers' compensation claims in the trucking sector. So first, what is whole body vibration? And when we measure whole body vibration, what we do is we put this little rubber pad on the top of the seat and inside there is a triaxial accelerometer and we can measure the exposure up and down, which is the Z axis, fore and aft, which is the X axis, and side to side, which is the Y axis. And being an engineer, what's nice about whole body vibration is it's an objective measure to describe the operation, operator's motion. It's a vector quantity which has magnitude or the intensity of the motion along with the direction of the motion. And when we uh, characterize the uh, vibration exposure, there's two things we usually characterize. One is frequency, how uh, often the op operator is uh, op oscillates or the exposure of the vibration to the operator in unit hertz, which is oscillations per second and the magnitude of the acceleration is how much of, of the vibration exposure are they exposed to. So when we look at whole body of vibration, we're primarily interested in low frequency vibration, anywhere from around one to around 20 hertz. If you're interested in hand arm vibration, these tools oscillate at a much higher rate and there's higher frequencies you're concerned about. So we're predominantly interested in low frequency vibration between one to 20 hertz. And the challenge that happens is when the uh, frequency content of the uh, vibration energy matches the natural resonant frequency of the structures receiving the vibration. And I have a great example here from Washington State, uh, Washington State, which is the Tacoma Narrows Bridge. And here is a clip. Oops, sorry. Now mute my sound. Here's a clip of that. So what happened is the frequency content uh, of the the wind hitting the bridge matched the natural resonant frequency of the structure. And you can see when that happens, it makes uh, structures do things they normally don't do. So that's why we're interested in the frequency content. So if you look at this human being here, uh, if you look at the uh, spinal column, that has a resonant frequency of 10 to 12 hertz. So anything vibration with a frequency of 10 to 12 hertz is going to excite the spine and make it resonate. Uh, resonant frequency goes down with mass. So if you look at your internal organs and your abdominal mass, that's going to resonate at 4 to 5 hertz. And your shoulder uh, is, I'm sorry, 4 to 8 hertz. And your shoulder is going to resonate at 4 to 8 hertz, 4 to 5 hertz. So that's why we're interested in these low frequency exposures and why frequency is important. It kind of determines what structures within the body will uh, be subject, subjected to the vibration. All right, so I basically reviewed uh, this, why the frequency is important, uh, and let me continue on. Now I wanna go through a chronology of seat evolution in commercial vehicles. So back in the 1950s, we used to have these height adjustable seats where the pedestal was height adjustable, but only the foam could provide the protection. Then around a decade later, we started to get these mechanical suspension seats where now there was height adjustment and vibration absorption within the suspension of the seat. Uh, and uh, roughly 20 years later, we got air suspension seats uh, where there was height adjustment and then you're riding on a cushion of air rather than a mechanical spring suspension. And what I'd like you to think about is if you were a bus or a truck driver, whether you'd like to ride in the 1950s, 1960s, or 1980s vintage seat. 
and uh, keep that to your memory and uh, we'll see which seat you'll choose at the end of this presentation. So one of the challenges uh, with these uh, suspended seats, both mechanical and air suspension seats, is sometimes they can amplify, amplify the vibration exposure. So this is an example of somebody just going over an expansion joint on a freeway in Seattle, and you wouldn't even notice this going over uh, this expansion joint in a car, but buses and trucks are so heavy that their suspension is very stiff and they do not have a lot of travel. So here's a bus driver going over an expansion joint at a roughly 50 miles an hour. So you, what you can see is that red trace is the vibration measured from the top of the seat. And you see these two peaks here. And what can happen is seats can either get uh, worn out or the driver is too heavy or they're under damped and the seat will bottom out. And relative to the vibration we measured from the floor of the bus, it amplified the vibration anywhere from three to six fold. So that's the challenge with these air suspension seats. You have a bump and you're hoping to get a magic carpet ride as shown by that blue dash line. You hit a bump, you get one jolt, you go out of the bump, you get another jolt, and instead of uh, uh, reducing the vibration, actually the suspension seat can amplify the vibration. So that's one of our challenges with these current suspension seats and on-road vehicles. So now what I'd like to talk about is how seats can affect uh, whole body vibration exposure. Um, and what I'd like to talk about is a study we did uh, around uh, six years ago looking at vibration exposures and bus drivers in uh, the city of Seattle. And what we did is we got uh, a 40 foot bus uh, and was around six years old, and we had a brand new air ride seat that we put in that bus. And what we were lucky to do, and which was wise, is we created the standardized route that these drivers drove on in Seattle, and there were 15 drivers. Uh, they spent four miles driving on city streets, roughly six miles driving on a smooth freeway. Uh, they traversed some speed humps at a community college. And then they had another four miles going down an old, tired freeway. And what I'm going to ask you to think and answer in your head is what percentage of the floor measured vibration or the, the vibration transmitted from the floor of the vehicle is absorbed by the seat and the seat suspension? So some of you might be thinking 80%, some might be thinking 50%, some maybe 20%. Um, so let's figure out how much vibration is this new air ride seat absorbing in the bus. So what this slide shows is the percentage of the vibration being transmitted to the operator. So where you see red, that is indicating where the seat is amplifying the vibration exposure. So roughly 10% of the time the seat is amplifying it. What's a little bit confusing is you see a lot of orange. And that's where 90% of the vibration is reaching the operator. And that's almost 90% of the time. And you can see uh, almost none of the time is the vibration uh, uh, being absorbed by 30% or more. So over this whole route, 88% of the vibration measured at the floor of the, the vehicle reached the driver. Or in other words, this seat was attenuating 12% of the vibration. So this is the first time we collected data, and I was a little surprised by this, uh, and we weren't sure if this was typical or not. And interestingly enough, I did spend some time working in Scandinavia, and for whatever reason, uh, and I don't know why, is they had some 1950s vintage seats in their buses. Uh, this seat uh, had no suspension, but it had height adjustment like an office chair. So they had these uh, old suspensionless seats in the buses and I was able to get one of these suspensionless seats and put it in the bus and have another group of uh, 16 drivers drive on our route and here's the results from our suspensionless seat that just had height adjustment. So this surprised us 
Uh, again, there's a portion of the time the seat was amplifying the vibration, uh, but you see some yellow here, which you don't see in the other figures. So there's some times where the seat was uh, attenuating 30% of the vibration or only 70% of the vibration was being transmitted to the operator. And over this whole route, 88% uh, of the floor measured vibration reached the driver or the seat was attenuating 11%. So you can see there's virtually no difference between the suspension seat and the suspensionless seat. So this had us really confused, like what's going on with these uh, air and mechanical suspension seats in these on-road vehicles. So uh, what happened uh, is we found out that these pedestal seats, uh, suspensionless seats don't do that bad. We we're surprised by that. And this is just for on-road use. I wouldn't use a suspensionless seat off-road. Uh, but then uh, we were thrown a curve. In 2010, there's a company that came out with an active suspension seat. Uh, and what this seat would do is it would uh, see the vibration coming to uh, the operator and it would, the suspension would try and actively cancel out the vibration. And of all companies, the company that developed the seat was Bose Corporation. They uh, used some of their sound canceling technology in their headphones. Uh, and applied it to a seat suspension. So uh, what this picture is going to show, and the gentleman on uh, the left is in a uh, passive suspension, an industry standard air suspension seat, and this gentleman in the right is in an active suspension seat, and see if you can see any differences, and they're going to be simulating a washboard road. So here's a, a front view of the, the two vehicle operators, a side view here. I think this is a subordinate. This looks like a cool comm manager. And then they're going to show the vibration in the feet. And I don't know if they controlled for coffee consumption before this vehicle was, uh, before this video was made but there's the vibration in the arms as well. So you can see a dramatic difference between the industry uh, standard uh, passive seat and this new active seat in vibration absorption. And basically the way the seat works, it has an air suspension like a regular seat, but it has an onboard computer and this linear electromagnetic motor and an accelerometer and it senses the, the acceleration coming up to the operator and this motor will either push the operator up or pull it down to counteract the acceleration coming up the pedestal of the seat. So what we did to evaluate this seat is we got a brand new uh, air suspension seat, a passive air suspension seat, and uh, an active suspension seat, and we put it in two semis, and we had truck drivers drive in tandem on a standardized route with each of the seats, and then when they got done, they switched trucks and drove on the route again. So we get uh, equally paired comparisons between the two seats with 15 truck drivers. And this just shows the standardized route we did. They drove over around 60 kilometers of road, uh, again, having different road types. There's stop and go city streets, freeways. Uh, slower speed highways and a rough road around a plant that had been patched and repaired several times. So again, now I'm going to show you results from a brand new air suspension seat. So now not only in buses, but this was measured in trucks. And what we found over this whole route, on average, 95% of the floor measured vibration was being transmitted to the operator or this brand new air suspension seat on average was only attenuating 5% of the vibration. Then when we show our results for the active suspension seat, we almost had to make a new color scale. So you can see predominantly most of the time, only 30% of the floor measured vibration is reaching the operator. So on average, this seat is reducing the vibration exposure by 64%. So what's amazing in usually health interventions, any sort of engineering controls we see are incremental, uh, but this really was a monumental change in exposure. We really usually do not see such big changes as products or uh, things in the workplace evolve. 
So the next thing we did is we did a randomized controlled trial uh, comparing uh, the industry standard passive air suspension truck seats and the active suspension truck seats. Uh, and what we did is we got 80 drivers with low back pain uh, and we exposed their whole body, we measured their whole body vibration. And then uh, 40 of the drivers were randomized and 20 received a new air suspension seat and the other 20 received the new active suspension seat. And uh, after they received their seats, we measured their whole body vibration exposures and assessed their low back pain and health outcomes. Uh, low back pain with a zero to 10 pain intensity scale. And we use the short form 12 for other measures of general health. And so we compared these outcomes in this randomized controlled trial between these two seats over a one year period. So uh, what I'm showing you here is a floor measured vibration from the vehicle. And uh, the dark uh, squares are the floor measured vibration from uh, the intervention group that received the active seat and the lighter bars with triangles are the control group. And this red dash line is the vibration action limit for eight hours of exposure. Uh, in the US, we do not have any standards to vibration exo exposure, but in Europe, they do have standards where if you're exposed to 0.5 meters per second squared for eight hours a day, that's the limit. If your exposure is above 0.5 meters per second squared, you have to operate your, or should operate your vehicle less than eight hours a day. If your vehicle is below 0.5 meters per second squared, you can operate your vehicle more than eight hours a day uh, before reaching these vibration action limits where they think adverse health outcomes will result. And PR stands for pre-intervention, PO stands for post, three months post, and six months post. And what's important is there's no difference in exposure between our two groups and the exposure did not change pre and post intervention. So uh, we had very good control uh, in the exposure for these truck drivers. And this shows the results of the two seating interventions. Uh, the, uh, the control group which received the industry standard seats had a slight reduction in vibration exposure down around 0.35 meters per second squared and the drivers that received the active suspension seats had a greater reduction with their vibration levels down to around 0.25 meters per second squared. And this level uh, is around the, the level you would experience driving your car. So it renders a semi-truck to ride like a car. And this uh, is showing how much vibration was transmitted to the operators, so the uh, industry standard air suspension seats transmitted 85% of the vibration to the operators, or meaning they attenuated 15%, whereas the active suspension seat attenuated 43% of the vibration. And this just shows how long you could drive before reaching uh, the 0 0.5 meters per second squared action limit. So it kind of shows from a driving perspective how the driving times could change. And in the active seats, you could literally drive the speed of light and drive 34 hours a day. And I'm not advocating somebody drives this long 16 hours a day or 34 hours a day, but that just shows you the effect of the engineer, engineering intervention on health outcomes on how long the drivers could drive before reaching the action limits. So this is the interesting thing. This is showing our low back pain results, again, for the uh, control group in the light colored uh, and the intervention group in the dark color with squares. And what happens is there were differences at baseline. And if we normalize the results relative to baseline, we did see some changes in uh, self-reported low back pain between the two groups. And we weren't able to get data after six months just due to term turnover and the truck drivers losing interest. But three months post-intervention, we saw over a 25% reduction in self-reported low back pain. And that's thought to be clinically meaningful. This didn't reach statistical significance. And I think this was uh, in part due to the small sample size we had and not enough power. But it looks like in one group, we saw a fairly substantial change in the self-reported 
low back pain. In the other group, we did see uh, an improvement, but a smaller improvement. But So the bottom line really is it does look like reducing whole body vibration exposure can have an impact on self-reported low back pain. Here's our results from the SF12, and none of these were significant, but they all kind of trended positive for the intervention. So for physical function, higher scores are better, and this red line is the average for the U.S. workforce. Uh, so we saw improvements in physical function and physical composite score. And here in the lower left, this is uh, sleep interruption, and lower values are better. And it looks like uh, there was a trend towards a difference in the sleep between the intervention and the control group. And here is the Oswestry Disability Index, and this is measuring uh, back function. And again, we saw small differences. And again, here, lower values are better. So we were somewhat encouraged in that it looks like uh, reducing whole body vibration uh, can reduce self-reported low back pain. Uh, and it looks like even more substantial reductions in whole body vibration may result in greater changes in uh, low back pain and self-reported physical function. So here's my takeaway from the study. We have this European action limit of 0 0.5 meters per second squared, and I like to golf, and I would call that a double bogey. It really doesn't seem to be protective. The drivers were below this value and having self-reported low back pain. And then these drivers ended up at 0 0.35 meters per second squared, and I call that bogey because we didn't see that substantial of a change in their self-reported uh, low back pain. Whereas in the group that received the uh, active suspension seat and had a vibration exposure of 0 0.25 meters per second squared, I kind of consider that par. That's where we saw uh, a pretty substantial reduction in the self-reported low back pain and, and a lot of trends in differences uh, in physical function between the two groups. So that's uh, somewhat of our takeaway from this small randomized controlled trial. And this is just one study. It's by no means definitive and hopefully it would be repeated in the future to see if others get similar effects. Now I'd like to go into safety and trucking. Uh, not only looking at injuries, but looking at accidents. And one of the challenges with that active suspension seat, I bet some of you are wondering, how much does that active suspension seat cost? Well, an industry standard air suspension seat will cost anywhere between six to $1,200. Uh, these active suspension seats are anywhere between four to $6,000. So they're fairly expensive. Uh, and uh, the trucking industry is very price sensitive. So uh, you're going to have to ask yourself, you know, is a four to $6,000 seat uh, worth uh, protecting yourself and maybe having a lower levels of back pain and uh, a better quality of life? And I think if you're an owner operator, that's uh, an easy answer. But if you work for a trucking company, probably a little bit more challenging for the trucking company to want to purchase those expensive seats. So we did a study, we wanted to see if there are any better air suspension seats out there uh, than the seats that we had measured from. So we did a study measuring whole body vibration across four different seats with the hopes of finding uh, better industry standard air suspension seats. Um, and what we're looking here uh, with these seats is seats we also think can affect your vigilance or your reaction. And if you're fatigued or less vigilant, vigilant, you may be prone to accidents. And uh, this study was not only to look at the vibration protection, but in a subsequent part, which I'm going to show you, we're looking at if the seats affected uh, vigilance. So with respect to uh, drivers and fatigue, 54% uh, of drivers have driven while feeling drowsy, and over a quarter report uh, falling asleep. Uh, with respect to truck drivers, almost half have reported to falling asleep in the wheel and a quarter in the past year. And relative to these injuries, with the average injury being 30000 uh, the cost of a vehicle accident is much more expensive. Uh, an accident can range anywhere between forty dollars and $90,000, and if there's a fatality, uh, the cost skyrockets to $3.6 million. 
So these accidents are very costly and these truck driver, uh, truck driving companies would desperately like to avoid these very expensive accidents along with all these various injuries that can occur as a result of exposure to whole body vibration. So with respect to vigilance, it's getting at fatigue, uh, cognitive fatigue, uh, affective or physical state of tiredness uh, caused uh, by exertion. Um, and vigilance, what vigilance really is, is the ability to attain, sustain attention to a task to a period of time. It's a fundamental co component of attention. And what we think is reductions in vid vigilance and performance uh, are uh, related to drowsiness or maybe related to the amount of full body vibration exposure the driver is subjected to. So in this study, what we wanted to determine is whether there are differences in whole body vibration exposures across the four seats we were gonna test. Uh, we wanted to uh, determine whether the whole body vibration exposure affected vigilance and PVT stands for the psychomotor vigilant task. And we wanted to determine whether uh, if we altered the whole body vibration exposure, if that would affect the driver's attention or their vigilance. So in this study, it was a crossover design. We got 24 truck drivers uh, and these drivers drove uh, very heavy duty nine axle trucks. Uh, and they sat in these trucks and used the four different truck seats. And the four seats they used was their uh, original seat, which was an industry standard air suspension seat. Uh, and then we tested two other aftermarket seats, one made by Sears Seating and another one made by Isringhausen. And then we also tested our uh, highly high performing active suspension seat. And what was nice about this is uh, this study involved a standardized route. These truck drivers would drive from their base to pick up aggregate in a mine, and then they would drive back to a port and uh, unload their aggregate and drive back to the base. So this was an 11 hour route where the drivers drove uh, the same truck uh, across this route with the four different seats serially installed. And we measured their whole body vibration exposure on these routes. Uh, again, uh, using our equipment here with our seat pad accelerometer, an accelerometer measured uh, at the ba on the base of the seat, and we also collected our GPS. And what was nice about the GPS is we could figure out what roads the vehicles were on and the speed they were traveling. So we could really dial in on different types of road types, and I'm not going to present those results here. So. If you look at the blue bar, these light blue bars, this is the whole body vibration exposure and use this axis here measured from the different seats. And uh, what we found out is there is a significant difference uh, between seat one, and you can see that the vibration is above the action limit of 0.5 meters per second, and the other three seats. So these uh, aftermarket seats all reduce the vibration uh, more than the industry standard seat sold with the truck. Um, and then what this axis on the right is in the dark blue bars is the percentage of the floor measured vibration transmitted to the driver. So in this seat, 100% of the floor measured vibration reached the driver. In this seat, 90%. In this seat, looks around 87%. And then the active seat, again, just 38%. Uh, but there were some differences between these industry standard um, passive suspension seats in the vibration exposure. And this uh, difference may not look that great, 0.2 meters per second squared, but the vibration is a uh, dose is on a logarithmic scale. So this is a, still a substantial reduction relative to the uh, industry standard or the existing seat in the trucks. And there you see the vibration action limit, whereas with the originally fitted seat, they're above the action limit of 0.5 meters per second squared, and with the other seats, they were below. So what this uh, does is I can take the vibration values and figure out how long you can drive until you reach the action limit. And here's an eight-hour day, and longer is better in this graph. 
And there's two types of exposure. There's the average weighted vibration, which is the continuous exposure. And there's some things I did not present or the vibration dose value, but that's exposure to bumps, jolts, and jarring. So if we just focus on the red bars here, the average weighted vibration, they could drive slightly less than eight hours with their original seat, whereas they could drive longer than eight hours with the other two seats. Uh, looks to be around 12 hours with seat two and 10 hours with seat three. And again, that active seat uh, reduces the exposure so much you'd have to drive longer than 24 hours in a day to reach the action limit. So just showing how much it reduces the vibration exposure. But uh, the good news is, is there were some other seats out there. So what we decided to do is we administered the psychomotor vigilance cast, and we found out that with the seats that reduced the vibration, we did not see differences in the psychomotor vigilance cast relative to the original fitted seat. So I'm gonna show you some results with this psychomotor vigilance task, but I'll give you a little bit of background first. What the psychomotor vigilance task is, is it's a sustained reaction time task, and subjects see numbers on a screen, and the numbers scroll, and they're supposed to push a space bar to stop the numbers scrolling. And these events are presented uh, every anywhere between two to 10 seconds, and the task runs for five to 10 minutes. And we just did a five minute task. And it's kind of the gold standard measure uh, for alertness. The psychomotor vigilance task is used in shift work, uh, sleep deprivation, and when people are exposed or chain shifts or are sleep deprived, uh, their uh, reaction times go down as measured by the psychomotor vigilance task. So it's very reliable and very valid, and it's uh, predominantly been used for sleep and shift work. And this is probably the first time it's been used to see uh, assess whole body vibration. So before the shift, what the driver would do is uh, they'd, we had a tablet, and there's a keyboard, and you'd have the screen here. And once these numbers would start scrolling, you'd try and press the space bar as fast as possible. And over this five minute period and the various uh, times that this was cued, which was typically between 30 to 50 times, we would get their mean reaction time. Long reactions greater than 500 milliseconds or half a second were considered lapses. Uh, we also measured their fastest reaction times because we well, thought it'd be hard to improve on your fastest reaction time. And we also measured the slowest reaction times. So this is the psychomotor vigilance task they did before and after their 11-hour shift uh, with each of the four different seats. But it wasn't uh, a complete repeated measurement, repeated measures study. Not all drivers were able to participate with all seats. Um, so we grouped the three seats that had lower bo whole body vibration exposures in the enhanced seat group, and we had 22 observations here. And we had 22 observations with the original seat. So all these graphs are based on 22 observations in each group. So if we look at the mean reaction times with the drivers uh, operating the truck with the original fitted seat that didn't have the, the greatest of whole body vibration attenuation properties, we saw an increase in the reaction times. Whereas in the drivers that operated the trucks over the same route with the enhanced seats, we saw a slight reduction in their reaction times. And this was significantly different. We saw the same thing with the fastest reaction times. The fastest of the fast reaction times uh, increased with the uh, original seat where that got better with the enhanced seat. The slowest reaction times increased with the original seat but got faster with the enhanced seats with these being significant. And the lapse probability, reaction times greater than 500 milliseconds, the percentage of those increase with the original seat uh, and also increase slightly with the enhanced seats, but this difference uh, approached significance but didn't reach statistical significance. So this was interesting to us in that it looked like uh, the amount of uh, vibration the drivers were exposed to could affect their reaction times. So this is a thought for us thinking, well, not only can we get at the health aspects of the vibration by reducing low back pain, uh, but also maybe uh, by uh, if we increase the driver's vigilance or have less of a vigilance uh, decrement, they may be less prone to these expensive accidents. 
So inclusion, there were differences in whole body vibration uh, exposures across the four seats, uh, but there were three seats that had lower exposure relative to the original seat uh, that the drivers received with their truck. Um, there were small changes in the PV outcome metrics that seemed to be dependent on the whole body vibration exposure, uh, where we uh, saw decrements in the PV task with the uh, higher vibration exposed drivers in the original seat compared to when they used uh, the enhanced seats. Um, and uh, so that was interesting to us, that it appears that there may be a relationship between how much vibration uh, the truck driver receives and uh, how their reaction times or their vigilance is affected. Okay. So, um, Looking at this, uh, seats that reduce full body vibration exposures may have an influence on uh, reducing low back pain. And what I'm thinking is if they reduce low back pain, it may reduce the occurrence, incidence, and severity of injuries. So there may be some savings in workers' compensation claims. And then this last study showed that uh, full body vibration appears to uh, affect vigilance and maybe seats that uh, decrease the vibration exposure will have less an effect on vigilance and reduce accidents. And uh, for those of you that know, uh, ergo is a four letter word sometimes in the political realm. Uh, it has the ergonomic standards have not fared too well, uh, but the good news is ergo also means another four letter word, which is money. Uh, and I'm purposely misspelling money, uh, in that there is billions that can be saved by reducing low back ca cases, and there's probably millions that can be saved by preventing accidents. So I'm trying to show that these uh, advanced enhanced seats can become profit centers for the companies that buy them, uh, rather than them shunning the more expensive prices and always purchasing on low cost. And so in conclusion, I think what we need to do is we have people that produce seats and people that consume the vehicles with these seats. And there's a little bit of a disconnect in that uh, your C-level person like the CFO pays million dollars uh, for your insurance premiums. There's multi-million dollars of health claims as in our bus municipality. And the purchasing person is not aware of the money spent on workers' compensation and these injuries. And if they were aware, if they procured a slightly better seat, that there would probably uh, be a net benefit uh, to the company purchasing a slightly better seat. And likewise, we have to educate our producers not to always just produce on low cost and sell on low cost and hopefully educate them that there's a social benefit to making products with better seats in them. Um, I think I'll just end here because uh, I'm almost out of time, but you remember our air suspension seat uh, attenuated 12% of the vibration. Our static seat attenuated 11%. And I want you to think about what if I just changed the foam material on the seat where the suspension didn't move? And would that affect the vibration exposure? And we got a special seat cushion that was used for absorbing IEDs. And if you've driven on some of these roads in Seattle, you might know that Seattle roads aren't unlike driving over IEDs, but we put this special air-filled seat cushion on there and we got an, an additional 22% vibration reduction just by changing the cushion on the seat. So the take home from this is the air suspension seats may not be used or needed in on-road vehicles. This is showing the vibration energy content as a function of frequency. And in buses, most of the vibration energy is around 10 hertz. But uh, also what happens is the amount of displacement you need to attenuate the vibration decreases with frequency. So if you see a, a car rental shuttle driver or a bus driver in their seat bouncing around, that's probably unneeded movement where the seat's amplifying the vibration, and we need to make better seats that are better at getting rid of the, this more noxious short travel vibration, and it's kind of a, a paradox. You wouldn't think that the vibrations you may not be able to see are the ones that may be more harmful. Um, 
So with that, I would like to end and open it up for questions, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, um, Pete, for that. It was, it was wonderful. Um, I will be going through the question and answer box to have Dr. Johnson answering anything that you guys might have to say. So if you do want to add anything to the Q&A box, it's right, before, or right below the, the slide uh, deck here. So I'm going to go through some of the questions that I see in the chat. Um, and the first one is from uh, Kathleen. And she asks if it's required to have an armrest on these chairs. Um, so armrests are actually optional. It may somewhat depend on the, the vehicle and the function of the vehicle. You know, it's easier to have armrests on office chairs, uh, but sometimes armrests can get in the way. So it's more vehicle dependent. So if you look at uh, trucks, most truck seats do have armrests. Uh, but if you look at bus seats, uh, there may be a fair number of bus seats that don't have armrests. And usually they're gripping the steering wheel, so they don't necessarily need the armrest to support the weight of the arms. Okay, thank you. Um, Jose asked, um, do you have any recommendations on commercially available acceler uh, accelerometer or seat pads oh. um, for measuring vibration for industrial application? Yeah, that's a great question, Jose, is, you know, there are systems out there uh, and there are numerous systems. We use ones made by Rion and the accelerometers by PCB. Uh, there are other ones uh, made by Larson Davis. Uh, the bottom line is they're fairly expensive. It's probably going to cost you at least six to $8,000 to have a, a, a system that measures the acceleration. But there are some uh, less expensive technologies out there that have uh, research-like uh, quality. And one of them is the Activity AX3. It's basically a small cube that has a triaxial accelerometer, uh, 512 megabytes of built-in memory and a lithium-ion battery. And uh, that's $130. And we've tested that and it has almost the same quality as our research-grade equipment. So there may be some less uh, expensive options out there in the future. Okay, thank you. Um, Sharon asks, uh, kind of on the same, on the same um, question, is what is the cost for the Bose seat versus some of the other post-market seats? Right. So that Bose seat is anywhere, and, and, and ironically, Bose got out of the truck seat business, but they sold it to a company called Clear Motion. Uh, and the seat is still being produced. So it's uh, probably $6,000 if you were an owner operator. And if you have a fleet, I think it'd be priced around $4,000. And these other uh, aftermarket seats are anywhere between $600 and uh, $1,500. And Dave asked, um, do you know about Sears semi-active seat and can you compare that to the Bose seat? Yes, I am familiar with uh, Sears' new seat, and we have tested it uh, a little bit, and it seems to be in between the performance of a high-performing air ride seat and the active suspension seat. So it seems like it's an, a step and an evolution in the right direction. It's not as great as the active suspension seat, but it's certainly better than uh, any of the air suspension seats that we have uh, evaluated. And do you know the approximate cost of that new Sears seat? I do not know the approximate cost, but I would, I think I can give a close guesstimate that it's probably somewhere near $2,000. Okay, thank you. Um, Kathleen asked, have you looked at the role of lumbar support in reducing self-reported back pain? Oh boy, that's a, a great question. And posture is a whole nother, uh, I'll be skeptical and say can of worms involved in this as well, because posture is probably an important contributing factor. But certainly a lumbar support can help uh, restore the natural uh, curvature of the spine. Um, so, and a lot of these seats have uh, air bladders and like three of them arranged uh, uh, horizontally. So it can either push in the lower uh, middle or upper portion of the lumbar area, depending on uh, how high the person's lumbar area is. So there are seats 
uh, out there that do have adjustable lumbar support. Okay, thank you. Cheryl is asking, is the active suspension seat design similar to office task chairs that provide dynamic or active capability? I'm thinking that's office desk chairs. Right, right. Yeah, so this active seat, really, it's not active in that it's moving you around and going from one position to the next position, which we think is good for office chairs. Uh, it's just looking at the uh, vibrations coming up through the seat, and it's actively uh, canceling it. So it's almost counter to that in that it makes you sit very still. And some of the experienced drivers find that kind of uncomfortable. They hate losing the feel of the road with the active seat. So uh, uh, sometimes it's hard to tr teach an old dog new tricks. And uh, um, some people just do not like those active suspension seats, just like trying to predict everybody's favorite food is uh, there isn't universally a favorite food for everybody. Okay, thank you. Um, Pedro asked, uh, when can we begin to observe uh, regulations regarding specific recommendations for the ergonomic designs? Ooh. So there's probably two questions there. One is maybe the ergonomic design of seats. And there probably are, there are standards out for uh, sizes of seats and things along that line. The other part of that question is the regulation of full body vibration exposures like trying to keep exposures below 0.5 meters per second squared like they have in Europe. And uh, they have regulations in Europe, but I would be surprised to see if we ever have regulations in the United States. Uh, just, uh, it seems like the, the US and the way we're structured is not very amenable to having standards, uh, ergonomic standards or protective standards put in place for our workers, which is unfortunate. Thank you for that. Um, Kathleen also asked, how often should these seats be replaced? Oh, there's a million dollar question. Um, and some of it is we may know and some of it is we may not know. So like in these bus seats, the foam of the seats uh, that the drivers sit on fatigue since buses are used so much and they last around 18 months. So for example, our bus municipality changes out the seat pads every 18 months. The shocks seem to wear out uh, every five years in buses. I think these truck seats, uh, they last uh, a lot longer, but there's some environments like in mining vehicles where these vehicles are operated in rough roads 24 seven. And I wouldn't be surprised if those seats got worn out in uh, you know, a year or less than a year and that they could benefit probably uh, and be better off in the long run, probably have lower injury claims by uh, having a very strict seat maintenance protocol or some sort of replacement protocol because in, in very uh, extreme environments, I think the seats wear out faster and they probably wear out faster in off-road environments than they do in on-road environments. Okay, thank you. And um, Trevor asked, do you know if active seating has penetrated other industries such as forklifts or construction equipment? Another great question. So these active seats are expensive and that's part of why they really weren't successful in the, the trucking sector. Um, uh, they keep trucks three to five years and uh, the drivers typically aren't unionized. Um, and where you'll see inroads is they are now making active seats for buses and buses cost anywhere from a half to $1.5 million. The bus municipality keeps them 15 years uh, and they have a, a very expensive or more expensive unionized uh, workforce. So I think we would see active seats wherever there are expensive vehicles with unionized labor. So one area you may not see them, which is kind of counterintuitive is like, Forklift drivers may be uh, highly exposed, but these small forklifts are often leased and often just hourly employees on there. So uh, you wouldn't see an active seat on a vehicle like that. Whereas if you look at these container handles, handlers in the Port of Seattle that handle these big metal crates, those are half a million to a million dollars in unionized people. And you, you probably would see active seats in there as, as our knowledge increases. Okay, thank you. Um, SB um, asks, do you know the effects of vibration on the higher levels of the spine, such as the thoracic and cervical levels? 
Oh, that is a good uh, question. We know it, the vibration transmits through the spine all the way up to the head. Uh, and we know we have a lot of problems in the low back, but the, the, the neck is another commonly affected area. And it seems like it's the areas of the spine where we have flexibility. So we do see a lot of problems in the low back and the, the neck area. Uh, but uh, the uh, vibration transmissibility in the neck area is not as well understood uh, as in the low back. But another important region is the, the neck and shoulders. Okay, thank you. Um, Kathleen asks, if a uh, dose-response relationship is five years, would we need a five-year study to truly evaluate the active seat benefits? Oh, another great uh, question. And, and Kathleen, I'm gonna accept $10 million from you to carry out that study. Um, I think uh, that's a great question. I think there's ways we can get at it. Um, for example, there are some companies that have gone whole hog and adopted the active suspension seat. And I'd like to retrospectively go back and look at their injury claims the five years before, five years after, and 10 years after uh, using these active seats. And I think there may be some information there. Um, and, and it'd be great to do a prospective longitudinal study, uh, but it's really challenging cost-wise, and also there's heavy turnover in the trucking sector, but maybe less turnover in the bus sector. So uh, I think that would be great if we could do it. And uh, maybe there are other ways like looking at claims before and after intervention. Okay, and I will go ahead and ask one more question. And uh, Dave asked if there is an ANSI working group for seat design standards for WBV. Oh, uh, there, there. I, I know there's an ANSI uh, working group for uh, measuring and assessing whole body vibration exposure. I don't know if there is an ANSI working group specifically on seat design or really suspension design. I know there's not a working group on suspension design, but I would suspect there are groups that uh, dictate uh, sizes of the seats to meet the anthropometry of the population that expects to operate the, the vehicle. So I know there are some standards and I wish I knew more on the like the design of the seat tops and things like that, but there's nothing really regulating what's between the seat and the floor of the, the vehicle as far as standards or design. Okay. And um we will be posting um, some of these resources available online um, at coeh.berkeley.edu if you go to our um, NIOSH ERC webinars page and navigate there. But I just wanted to thank you so much, um, Pete, for coming out here and for everyone who joined us for today's webinar. Our next NIOSH ERC webinar will be Mechanics of Human Lower Back and Occupational Low Back Pain on Wednesday, May 17th with Dr. Babak Bazgari with the University of Washington. Thank you everybody for um, joining us today. All right, thanks Jessica and thanks to all the attendees.